How's everyone doing? Cool. Still really hyped about hearing about some cool DevOps stuff. I mean, it's the last breakout session of the conference. Everybody still awake? Great. Uh, I'm going to start with two questions. Who has heard about Kubernetes before? Nice. How about Jenkins? Cool. So I, I came to the right conference. That's a great thing. I think this is going to be a success now. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to combine these two, so Jenkins and Kubernetes. We're going to talk a, a bit about the Kubernetes plugin, but also more in general, like how you can utilize Kubernetes in Jenkins. Uh, first, shortly about us, who are we? My name is Severi Haverla, and the fine gentleman on the DJ stand here is Niklas Danskanen. Hello. And we both, we come from a company called Efficode. Uh, so what's Efficode? It's the leading DevOps house in the Nordics. So we do DevOps consultation. For example, me and Niklas, we have been, or we have worked at the leading telco in Finland. Uh, doing a lot of DevOps things, if you can say so. So we have helped the uh, development teams there to kind of modernize their ways of working. So to help them to use Kubernetes and, and create cool pipelines that, that integrate Jenkins with Kubernetes. And that's why we are also here to talk about this topic today. We also do some other stuff. We actually have a, a a product as well called uh, Efficode Root. It's a DevOps platform. You can Google it later. I'm not going to talk about it now. But let's start with the actual topic at hand, shall we? OK. Uh, before diving into the uh, usage of uh, Jenkins and Kubernetes together, let's review a few options that we have when we are thinking about scaling Jenkins. Uh, well, the first one is simple. Let's just add more resources to the, our Jenkins master. Uh, when, we're, when our builds get, are getting slow, let's just add more CPU cores and more memory. And that's a fine idea. But when you have a 64 core beast running in AVS, that's going to cost you a lot of money. And for me, uh, personally, I don't think that's a very good idea because you have a single point of failure. Uh, the costs are great. And how do you handle? Uh, different versions of Java or PHP or whatever you're using. So the next idea is to add more nodes to your Jenkins installation, more agents. Uh, so at least at, when you have uh, more nodes, you can install different versions of software into a different server. But how do you handle concurrent usage? How do you handle security updates? How do you handle uh, the uh, bill when it comes from the AVS? Leads to uh, unhappy developer teams. Leads to an unhappy operate, oper operations teams. Leads to uh, unhappy managers. There has to be a better way uh, to scale Jenkins, right? So what could be a better way? I'm telling you there's a hint on this slide. Uh, containers. Maybe you've heard about it. Docker. So as all of you might know, Docker and containers in general, they're a great way to isolate environments and, and, and handle the dependencies that go into that particular environment. So maybe we could use Docker or containers to run the, uh, the Jenkins agents. Sounds like a fair deal. But there's one problem. How do we or orchestrate those containers? I mean, we don't want to have this 64-core beast Jenkins master uh, pu putting up the, the Docker containers by, by itself. So of course, we need Kubernetes. If you change the slide, what is Kubernetes all about? You all are DevOps professionals, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. but. What it basically does is that it orchestrates the, the containers on the underlying Kubernetes cluster. So it basically, basically abstracts all the, all the nodes from you. You don't have to know where, the, where your container is actually running. You just tell Kubernetes to give you a container somewhere and be happy with it. Next. So how does 
this all integrate with Jenkins? Well, it's the Kubernetes plugin. I mean, we're using Jenkins, so of course it's another plugin. So <laughs> let's, let's see how, how the workflow goes with the usage of this plugin, shall we? So this is a rough idea, what, what happens in the background. Uh, so first you have your developer, maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody else doing the code changes, doing some cool new features, and the developer pushes those changes to GitHub or whatever version control you're using, and that will trigger a build on your Jenkins. And the Jenkins will execute your CI CD pipeline, which hopefully is implemented as code as Jenkins file. And in that Jenkins file, you can define that, okay, for this particular section of, of my CI CD pipeline, I'm gonna need, let's say, Python 2.7 or something like that. So you can then, in your pipeline, you can instruct Kubernetes that, all right, Kubernetes, give me a container that's running Python 2.7 and I want to execute this code, code there. So Kubernetes will do just that, it will create a pod that has a Python 2.7 container running inside. It will also have a JNLP container running in the same pod that will then contact the Jenkins master basically and tell them, okay, I'm here, I'm ready, give me something to do. And then you execute whatever commands you have defined in your pipeline on that particular container. You can execute it on the JNLP container, you can execute it on the Python container, doesn't matter. I guess if you're using Python, you want to execute it on the Python container, I assume. And then when you're done with it, uh, you basically then tell, the, or the Jenkins tells Kubernetes that, all right, thanks, I'm, I'm done. I don't, I don't need the container anymore. And Kubernetes is going to delete the container and the resources are free again, are available for other jobs to use. Yeah, that's the workflow. All right, time for our first demo. Uh, before uh, diving into the demo, just gonna tell you that I have, a, for the demo purposes, I have set up a Kubernetes cluster in the Google Cloud. I have installed Jenkins into that Kubernetes cluster, and I have configured the Jenkins uh, to use the Kubernetes plugin to talk with the Kubernetes. And what I'm gonna show you is just how simple it is uh, to define the container that I want to run inside the Kubernetes and execute commands uh, in that container. So here is how it looks uh, when you're using a pipeline. I have the pod template here configured. I have containers and I want to run Maven. So I just simply define that I want to run this Maven image from the Docker hub and when I'm, when I'm defining the pod template like this, later on on the pipeline, I can use the Maven container just simply using, by just simply using the container keyword. And if we go to the browser, where is that? Okay. Yeah. We're gonna take a moment here. <laughs> That's why we wanna do this live demo because it would, wouldn't be really interesting if, if we wouldn't screw up something. So we have something <laughs> to look for. I know this is why you came here. You read the word live demo and you were like, I hope they're gonna fail really hard, <laughs> right? There we 
We found the IP address. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, I know. <laughs> So anybody good at brute forcing the Jenkins? <laughs> you saw the IP address, so you can start doing it on your phones maybe now. So <laughs> please help us out here. You are so funny. <laughs> We can do the brute forcing as well, but. <laughs> Never trust the live demo, they said. <laughs> Well, yeah. You can check the logs of the container. It might have been printed there. Maybe, is but it this um, one? yeah, it is. But uh, it's not getting me in. Let's, I would assume we can continue with the slides and we can do, do this brute forcing at the end. No, here we oh, go. We here are. we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to the demo. Uh, this is going to be a, a little quicker <laughs> now. But uh, when I just simply start the build here using the build now button, uh, and let's go back to the Kubernetes. And here we go, just wait. So now what happens is that the Jenkins is talking to the Kubernetes that please set up this pod uh, with these containers up in the Kubernetes. And if you take a look at the Kubernetes side here, we can see that, that the node, Jenkins node, is now running inside the Kubernetes. And what happens here right now is that the Maven container is running the Maven install. Before that, it just did a simple git clone inside the pod. And after this finishes, uh, the resources that the node took, uh, like CPU or memory or disk space, uh, all is freed up for the next workload. And the container just simply vanishes from the Kubernetes cluster. And back to the slides. All right, so is it worth the effort to set something like this up? Nikos, how, how long did it took for you to set this demo up? About one hour. And half an hour you were trying to guess the password, right? Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> so let's see, Let, let's see why would you maybe want to do this? Let's continue with the next slide. So maybe you want to save your or your company's money, I don't know. And how, why is that? Because 
Kubernetes enables you to utilize only the resources when in your cluster when you actually need them. As, as you saw, you create a pod, you run something there, it will take up the CPU and the memory it needs, and when it's done, it just disappears and, uh, and the resource pool is, is freed up again. And for example, you could also, when you think about the public cloud, like, like let's say Google Cloud, you can do stuff like, okay, you maybe have 10 nodes in your Kubernetes cluster normally, but then there's a peak hour and you want to scale up your nodes. You want to have 30 nodes, for example. This is actually really simple. It's just a click of a button on the, on the, on the Google console that says like, okay, please, if there's like a lot of work, workload coming and the current resources are not enough, then give, it, give me more nodes. And when the peak hour is over, then those nodes will disappear again. So you only pay for the resources you actually use. That is quite nice. And you can also combine it, if, if you have a private cloud as well, you could utilize the public cloud together with your private cloud. So let's say normally you, you are able to run all the workloads in your own, own private cloud, but there are some, some peak hours that you don't have all the resources available in your own data center. So maybe you could create a hybrid cloud that you actually, during those peak hours, you will start using a, a, a public cloud for running those workloads. So that you don't have to buy, buy new servers just because there's like a lot of resource used, it's like, like once a month, for example. So what else? It's faster. Why is it faster? Because you are utilizing your resources better. You, you don't, you're not sharing the, like, the agents with, with anybody. If you need an agent with, with this much CPU, this much memory, you will get it. And that's it. So you can, you can actually like create builders. If your builder needs a lot of memory, you can create a pod that has more memory. And that's how your developers, they will, they will be more happy because, I mean, I hate waiting for the builds to finish. And I, th I think everybody that does. So if you can, create faster CI CD pipelines with this, I think it's a really good, good idea to do so. And you can do pretty cool stuff as well. Let's say you have some really GPU intensive stuff that you want to run in your pipeline. I don't know, you want to mine some, some crypto coins or whatever you wanna do. You could actually have like specially tailored nodes to handle that. So you could, could have nodes that have more GPU available. And you could target those nodes by just adding a node selector to your pipeline and saying like, okay, this container should be running on, on, on these kind of nodes. And that's it, it's, it's pretty simple. So you can, you can really like specialize your workloads as, as well. So what else? Um, I hope that every one of you is using a version control to store your application source codes. If not, you can talk to us afterwards. Uh, but what else should be code? Maybe the CI CD pipeline, I mean Jenkins files. They should be stored in the same place where your actually the application source, source code is. What else? How about the environment where you run your CI CD pipelines, pipelines on? So containers, Docker files. That's what you get when you're using this Kubernetes plugin. You can, you can actually have your containers described as code, and you can store them also in your version control system. So you know what's there. And the next slide, the good thing is that you will also get isolated environments. You don't have to fight with the other teams in your company, like, no, I don't want to have this installed on my, on my Jenkins node, or I, I need this version of Python, or I need this version of Java, or whatever. You don't have to make any compromises on this. It's containers, right? So it's isolated. It's, it's for you, your use only or your team's usage. Of course, if you have like, if, if all of your teams are using the same technology stack, that's, that's easy. You can just utilize the same containers. But if you, need, if you need something really specific, you can create your own containers and use those. You don't really have to care what the others are doing. And of course, you're gonna be working with some cutting edge technology. So first use the one hour to set up all of this. 
Then maybe play around with it for two weeks, and then you can go to LinkedIn and say that, OK, I'm a Kubernetes professional now. <laughs> now, but jokes aside, um, I think these kind of technologies, they emerge for a reason. And in this type of business, it's, it's really important to stay up to date with the, with the new technologies. You want to stay relevant, because if you don't, the other companies who are investing in the new technologies, they will be able to innovate faster, to create software faster, and it's going to cost less, and they will attract better talent because you're using the cool stuff, right? So just food for thought. All right. Time for our next demo. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, uh, let's review a few best practices when you're using Kubernetes or containers or Jenkins or all of this. Uh, use small containers, uh, meaning that if you have, for example, a database container uh, for your application, uh, do not put the initial data that you need to up upload to the database into the container, uh, but get it elsewhere when the container is running. That's because uh, if you have big containers, it's going to slow down your development time because the Kubernetes node has to download the container in order to run it. And if it's bigger, it's going to take more time. Agent containers should also be built using CI, uh, meaning that if and when you are building your own Jenkins node containers, you should build them also using CI, because otherwise that leads to a situation where you have um, some developer writing Docker file and pushing the agent container in the registry, and then uh, he or she leaves the company and takes their Docker files with them, and you have a containers running that you don't know what's in them or how to update them. Configuration as code. Uh, this is a, especially a Kubernetes plugin thing. Uh, use the Jenkins file as much as possible uh, to uh, configure the usage of the plugin. Uh, there's a two ways to do uh, configuration of Kubernetes plugin. One is by using the UI, or one is by using the Jenkins file. Use the Jenkins file. And the last one is utilize Godas by defining active deadline seconds. <coughs> Meaning that if you have more than one user in your Kubernetes cluster, you're going to want to set Godas uh, for the users so they don't get to spend every resources there is in the, in the cluster. And you can define Gotas uh, in Kubernetes in two ways. Or actually, there are many ways. But uh, for example, you can have one quota for long-running uh, tasks, such as uh, databases or web servers. And you have another quota for uh, workloads that are supposed to be run for a small, small moment, like builds. And what I'm going to demo next is the configuration as code, uh, as you saw earlier, and then this active deadline seconds method. So let's go to the Jenkins. And let's start our next demo. So this is basically the same pipeline that I have had on the previous demo. Uh, I can show you the pipeline file. It's here. And this is basically the same, but I have defined uh, resource requests, requests uh, to the Kubernetes that please, uh, Kubernetes, run this part and run it with these resources. And if you take a look at the Jenkins, uh, nothing's happening. I'm not getting, getting uh, a part. And if you go to the, uh, to the Kubernetes and review our Gualtas. There's a two quotas. Uh, and if I go and see the long running quota, the 
Quota is pretty low for me and definitely not enough to run the Maven container. And if I take a look at the short running Gota, uh, I have much more uh, capa capacity there than I had on the long running Gota. I can also check the uh, Jenkins logs and see. And I'm seeing errors like uh, uh, the slave is forbidden, exceeding quota. So what I have to do is that I have to use the quota for the uh, short, running, short running workloads. And how, go, how can I do this? Well, uh, I can add the active deadline seconds say, to the pipeline to the part template. And what this means is that after, the, uh, after this time limit, the Kubernetes will kill the part if it's still running inside the Kubernetes. And if I go, uh, copy and paste this to the pipeline and start the build, And we can take a look of the Kubernetes side. There it is. And it's already running. And we can also take the look, we can also take a look of the short running Gota now. And we can see that it's using now, the slave there is now using the short running Gota. So this is a good way uh, to restrict resources uh, for the developers so that uh, they have to really think about uh, running their workloads in the Kubernetes. Okay, uh, next, where this does not fit. Where does the Kubernetes plugin does not fit? <laughs> uh, for Windows, and this is not entirely true. Uh, I guess you could run Windows nodes uh, in Kubernetes using Windows containers. I haven't tested it. Uh, but still, you don't have the desktop environment and I would like to have the desktop environment inside the container so I could run uh, uh, browser testing or if I have an MSI installer, uh, I can uh, uh, test that. But I can't because the Windows containers do not support the desktop environment. So no Windows containers uh, if you need the desktop environment and you pretty much always do. Again, uh, no fat containers. Uh, do not run fat containers with the Kubernetes plugin or in the Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes offers you the possibility to add that storage into those containers, and from there you can use your big files. And then, uh, do not run containers as privileged. That's a bad idea. Because containers, uh, they share the same kernel that the, uh, that the uh, node host is using. And if you have a privileged container, uh, it might be possible for the uh, uh, container to break out of the containment. And, and uh, if they break out of the containment, they have access to the Kubernetes cluster. And that way it's uh, not secure anymore. If you have a need for privileged uh, containers, create a separate cluster that it's meant for that or use VMs. All right, so what does Kubernetes enable us and Kubernetes with Jenkins? What, what can we achieve with that? So first we can do parallel building. Next slide, please. But I mean, this is nothing new. You can, you can do it with your static nodes as well. But what I mean with this, it, it's really easy to create like 
really many different kinds of builder pods because you can, you, they are containers. So you can, you can create specific containers for your specific needs and only use the resources when they are needed. You don't have to fight over, over the, who, who gets the particular Jenkins node and, and which time and you don't have to queue with other teams like, okay, now it's my turn to run my builds. So it's easy to do parallel building, building with this. Next. But you can do a lot of other stuff as well. It, it doesn't have to be just build, builds that you do but parallel. You can, you can do, for example, first build your application for all the different platforms. And at the same time, you might want to do some static code analysis using Sonar Cube or, or whatnot, run some unit testing and, and things like this. So basically, the sky's the limit here. Well, not quite. I, I don't know if you've been to the, to the breakout session about the Jenkins networking. Uh, but basically, the, if you have a lot of agents running at the same time, there, there's going to be a lot of traffic going to your Jenkins master. So that might be a bottleneck. Uh, waiting for the serverless Jenkins or the cloud native Jenkins. But before that, don't do these mega Jenkinses that serve the whole company. Have smaller. Jenkins masters that serve a specific purpose, maybe a specific product or, or whatever. So this won't be such an issue. You can also do other things like create isolated test environments on demand, for example. This is something we've done. Uh, what I mean with this is that, uh, for example, for acceptance testing, let's say you have your robot framework tests and you, you want to see that your, your application, like all, all your different microservices work together well. well for this, of course, this requires that you actually are able to deploy your application to Kubernetes as well. But it's pretty easy to create this kind of like on-demand test environments where you create your APIs and, and whatever and run your acceptance tests. And when you're done, then you just delete the environment and that's it. That's, that's a pretty cool idea, I think. And you can also do different kind of deployment strategies. You can do, for example, canary deployments. That's also something we have tried out. Uh, what it means is that you have your old production version running on, on Kubernetes. Again, this requires Kubernetes. And then you have your new release candidate coming out. And you decide that, OK, I want to try this out. How does it actually work in production? So you can create a pipeline that, where you can interact with, OK, let's say, like, OK, let's do a canary release. So let's put, let's say, 10% of the production traffic to the release candidate and see what happens. And if everything looks good, then let's go all in. Let's, let's create a new release. Let's put all, the, all of the traffic to the new, new version. And there's a lot of cool tools you might be able to try out later as well. So for example, Istio, uh, that's that's something that you could, for example, uh, mirror the production traffic to your release candidate as well. So all the traffic goes to production, but it also goes to your, to your release candidate. But nothing will get out of the release candidate. So you can just see how it behaves with the production traffic. I mean, this is really heavy working progress. I don't think it's there yet, but it's, it's coming. And of course, this, this requires something from your application. So your re release candidate cannot write to your database. Or if it, if it writes, then you have to handle that, that th there's no pro production traffic going there. Or somehow figure a way out that uh, you're able to handle, handle the production traffic in a way that you can, you can still like uh, stop doing what you're doing. Uh, so next slide. All right. Uh, Sounds cool. Uh, how do I get uh, to the stage and sweat with the Kubernetes? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you need to get Kubernetes. Uh, I would recommend the Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes engine. Uh, but if that's not the solution for you, uh, go to that link and pick the right solution for you. Once you have the Kubernetes cluster set up, install Jenkins into it and uh, install the plugin and then just start, start hacking. This all, uh, if you are open-minded, uh, takes about one hour, and then you should have the Jenkins in the Kubernetes. I guess we have some time for questions before beer. 
OK? Yeah, you. <laughs> There are a few fields there uh, that you cannot currently. Okay. Uh, do you ever use this to build a Docker image and push it? Sorry? Do you ever use this to build a Docker image and push it? Yeah, that's uh, Docker in Docker. Uh, you would have a Docker in Docker agent node, and you would build the Docker container there and send the, then push it to the registry. But I can't remember, have we used it for that? Uh, but it is possible. Hmm? So, uh, are there efforts with the open source community to, I guess, improve front-end connections communities, like with cloud native connections or something like that? Or is that just that? Mm, well, I'm, I'm not a Jenkins product expert, but uh, yes, there is. Uh, to improve running uh, Jenkins inside Kubernetes because let's face it, it's not cloud not native yet. Uh, but what I've heard uh, in this conference is that uh, there's an effort to make the Jenkins cloud native. Yep. Mm. How does this now, if they would overlap, if you have more than two, if they would sort of overlap in their specifications, like ranges of, uh, say, for instance, CPU, uh, how would it know which one to choose? Or oh, you mean which quota it would choose? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it all depends on the if the pod is configured with the deadline. If it's not, then it's going to use the long running quota. But if there's a deadline for the for the pod, the Jenkins will start a timer, uh, sorry, the Kubernetes will start a timer uh, when the pod comes up. And after the timer has passed, and if the pod is still running, the Kubernetes will kill it. And by this way, it's using the short-living quota. All right. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, I can show you the, the uh, this is the uh, short running quota here. And there's a scope for that. So when you're using a short running quota and when you're creating this quota to the Kubernetes, you specify a scope here. Uh, for long running quota, there's, uh, let's see if I can get that. I can. For the long running quota, the scope is not terminating. And for the short running quota, it's terminating. And this basically means that if the scope is terminating, it means that it searches for, search for, search for the pods that have active deadline seconds. Are there, are there other types of scopes, or are those the two? Those are the two that I know of. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you would have like a one tool per one container. Okay. And if I need to build a Docker image, I will have, a, for example, in Amazon, an EC2 instance just to build that Docker image. Uh, well, yeah, you have multiple ways to uh, uh, build a Docker images. You can do that inside Kubernetes as well. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, you have a question. Maybe it's nothing to do with the implementation, but how do you manage to do database changes or anything else? Just put a database and then on the image. <laughs> That's a good are, question. Are you, are you trying to get a free consultation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can discuss this afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>
if it's not okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's at least two fields in the uh, Kubernetes plugin that you need to configure. Do you think you could show us the one you need? Yeah. Uh, if you go to the Kubernetes, uh, to the Jenkins, and let's see the system here. Cloud. So this is the uh, configuration of the plugin. and you need to set up at least these two fields. These are used uh, to configure the Jenkins node in the Kubernetes uh, so that the node inside the Kubernetes knows uh, where the master is located. So uh, at least these two fields uh, need to be configured in the UI. I, I'm not sure if you can configure those in, in the Jenkins file. At least not yet. All right. When you did your pod template for the Kubernetes plugin, do you have any issues with it being in LP? No, no, but yeah, that's a good question because uh, uh, in this deadline file, I don't have the GNLP set up and it comes from the plugin directly. Okay. Mm. This way, I don't have to deal with the GNLP <laughs> because it's messy. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Like, are you using to start out news feeds? News? Which, which image, which page image are you, are you, are you using to, to start a news feed? Ah, uh, well, actually, what you're seeing here in the part template, uh, I have only defined a one image, but there are actually a two images inside the pod, one for talking with the Jenkins and one for the Maven tools. And uh, I really don't have any base images here. I'm just using stuff from the Docker Hub directly. So, but when you are using it this way that you have a two containers, JNLP container and Maven container, uh, you don't have to put the JNLP stuff, the J Jenkins agent stuff, into the Maven container. You can keep those separate. <laughs> yes. 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 No, this is not done. This this isn't in 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 the UI. GNLP, no, uh, it comes directly from the plugin. We had a question here. Th this may be completely basic, but I don't know uh, Kubernetes. But one of, one of the selling points is that it can scale up. But what do you do if your your application is scaling up to handle a DDoS? Then you just you just blow up or you use some sort of resource limit. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you can and you can define like what's the limit, like how many pods are gonna be created as well. So it, it you can say like, oh, it, it cannot create like millions of pods if you want. Yeah, and this is not a good answer, but uh, you should stop the DDoS before it enters yeah. Kubernetes. <laughs> hmm. All right. Stash, for example? Stash, yeah. yeah. Anything else? Time for beer, maybe? Beer. So, uh, thank you very much. If you liked the presentation, please give us feedback. Take your phones and you can w win the Nintendo Switch. If you didn't like it, put, put your phones back to your pockets. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.